I know how you are feeling. The stock market seems to be in frenzy mode. The S&P 500 is up more than 15% in the last six months. The SPY, the NASDAQ, and even the Dow Jones with 30 dinosaurs. Sorry. I mean companies with one of the longest track records are all near their all-time highs. So name any popular tech names. Meta platforms, Google, Amazon, Nvidia, and they've probably trashed the market by a huge margin. But do you want to take a guess? Out of the 500 companies in the S&P component today, how many actually produce results beating the index itself? So do type your guesses in the comments down below. So based on the time of this recording, it's not 300 out of 500, not 250, and it's not even 200. The real answer, 114 companies out of 500 have achieved a year-to-date performance of over 16%, beating the SPY. 114 out of 500, and that's roughly 23%. Now, it depends on whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person. To me, I look at this as a potential opportunity to hunt for quality companies that might not have done very well over the last six months in terms of share performance. And being out of favor might also mean that they're cheaper because there is not much hype or even interest around them today. But they might still be great long-term holes. So as the title of this video suggests, we are going to focus on finding quality stocks that have very strong fundamentals and are anti-fragile. So the first on the list is actually a power duo in the financial space. To no one's surprise, it's of course Visa and Mastercard. So comparing to the SPY with a 15% year-to-date performance, Visa and Master has underperformed by a margin at 4% and 6% respectively. That said, there have still been very respectable companies that delivered extraordinary shareholder returns if you were to drag out the timeline to the past 5 or even 10 years. Now, I think if you're a functional human being, not living in a cave and also watching YouTube right now, you will already know the core business and the mode of either Visa and MasterCard. Therefore, I wouldn't belabor the point. I would instead like to just focus on a few key catalysts and areas of risk before plowing head in. So as a company, both of them have demonstrated strong revenue and income growth, benefiting from their dominant position, basically a duopoly in the payment processing industry, which is tied to the overall transaction value being done in the ecosystem. So being in this payments industry allowed them to tell a beautiful story. They are very well diversified because they are basically a bet on the prosperity of the entire world, a toll booth of some sort on the world's consumption. They are inflation proof because their fees escalate accordingly and their network effect can't seem to be disrupted. The risk? Everyone is looking at stealing the lunch from digital wallets, to traditional financing companies, to new fintech startups, to real-time payment systems, and even the crypto space. The fintech space is seemingly getting more and more crowded. But at least based on Visa and Master's execution over the last few quarters, they've established a mode so wide and so strong that there are no signs of serious technological threat yet. Another important consideration is the relatively high valuation companies like Visa and Master trades at. So I know they're good, you know they're good, so does everyone else. That's why the market is willing to cough up a premium valuation. So a hack for buying into such companies is to take advantage of it during a broad-based market sell-off. So as far as we are concerned, Visa and Master is definitely on our watch list. Now the second contender on this list is another player in finance, but not in the fintech space. They're in asset management, and if you're looking into this space, you can never miss out BlackRock. So it is not the first time that we have shown a spotlight on BlackRock. The previous time we've talked about it was in August of last year. And since then, they have appreciated by a modest 10% or so. However, the BlackRock of 2024 was rather disappointing. Not only did they underperform the index of 15% year to date, but they have also clocked in negative share performance over the last six months. Now, the share price aside, we believe that BlackRock's current leadership and brand position provides for a competitive edge in attracting new customers and also charging premium pricing due to the trust equity that they've built out over the past few decades, which is arguably one of the most important factors in the money management business. 
So a recent example of such brand equity would be during the launch of a spot Bitcoin ETF. So many asset managers tried to penetrate into the space with great offers. But BlackRock's iBit was still the go-to ETF, surpassing $10 billion in asset under management in 49 days, and Fidelity coming in second at 77 days. So previously, JEPQ held the record for the fastest ETF reaching $10 billion in AUM in 647 trading days, which is right around three years or so. So that's the power of both incredible demand and the high trust equity. So BlackRock's AUM has grown at a CAGR compound annual growth rate of 13% since 2008, and they've supported their shares through consistent dividend increases and share buybacks. Barring any black swan and global growth impediment, we foresee BlackRock continuing to expand its asset base across the globe, regardless rain or shine, and its current valuation doesn't seem demanded. The third on the list is actually Adobe. So similar to BlackRock, Adobe didn't have a good run in 2024 either. So Adobe, despite being a leader in the creativity, productivity, and digital experience space, they've came under immense pressure with the scaling of cheaper and more beginner-friendly alternatives like Canva. And also not to forget the introduction of Gen AI alternatives to both picture and video generation. So here's the interesting thing. Adobe was never marketed to be the solution for the mass market. So they've always positioned themselves for professionals and heavy duty work. So it's through the maturing of social media and the creator economy, where the demand for users to express their creativity for both as a hobby or even semi-professionally essentially exploded. However, if we were to look at the design or creative industry through a professional lens, the level of details, nuance, and precision cannot be discounted. And in the same vein, Adobe probably cannot be discounted. So it's true that Gen AI might be playing an increasingly important role in the creative industry. But Adobe has reflected strong intention of staying in the game with innovation across their product offerings, especially with the introduction of AI-driven features and general availability of Firefly services and custom models. So this space remains in the infancy stage with loads of experimentation and uncertainty. Time will tell, but Adobe's strong market position and well-defined product will keep them in the lead for now. That's it, Adobe's current valuation stays in line with the historical averages. And we tend to only add to our positions when the stock is on a discount. So since you have stayed till the end, we have a bonus mention, and that's actually Lululemon. So out of the 500 companies in the S&P, Lulu has been one of the huh? worst performer, experiencing more than 40% drawdown in the last six months alone. So Lulu operates in the Asia market, with a strong foothold in the yoga community, essentially building a cult-like brand following. And their core marketing strategy focuses on building local communities and leveraging social media. So they employ a vertical retail strategy with a significant focus on D2C, which is direct to consumer, which essentially accounts for 91% of their sales. And this offers great customer engagement, insights, and driving faster response time to consumer demand. Now, what about the bear thesis? Due to crazy high margins that they've managed to levy or even squeeze out from their customers due to their cult-like branding, competitors in the space are mounting a significant comeback to grab market share. So the recent flattish same-store sales in their North America portfolio has raised concerns over their growth sustainability in the largest market. Right now, there is a high level of skepticism around Lulu's ability to consistently execute its ambitious growth plans, particularly so in their overseas market, while defending their existing market share. So a large part about investing in such brand-dominant companies requires us to consistently monitor and also evaluate the value of the branding and also the association. And once such branding goes down the wrong path, the investment thesis will be broken. For now, we believe that Lulu's branding quality is still largely intact, but it is not an investment that we can just buy and forget. So out of these four names, which companies are you most interested in and why? We look forward to seeing your answers in the comments down below. So this is CK from Piranha Profits signing off. Till next time, keep winning.